It is my great pleasure now to invite Doug Sabrin up to the chancel. Most, if not all of you, know Doug. He's been a friend of our church for many, many years. In fact, a part of this congregation since the 80s, when he followed his family here. Since that time, he's participated in many church activities, and these have filled his heart and ours. He recently retired after a 50-year career as a social worker involved in local, political, local, provincial, national, and international work. He has taught interracial and intercultural social work practice at UBC, leadership at Douglas College, and the nonprofit sector. At Simon Fraser, Doug's graduate work was in the area of poverty and the guaranteed annual income, and is one of the few remaining experts from a time when there was great enthusiasm and support for alternatives to the traditional welfare state. Doug is best known for his community work through the neighborhood house movement, both locally, nationally, and internationally again. His community work has been recognized, and most recently, he was named as Delta's Collaborator of the Year for his leadership of the Delta Food Coalition. Despite all this experience, he remains, he tells me, foolishly optimistic and trusting that our fellow citizens will return to the values that have defined us as a nation. I'm hoping there will be a time for questions afterwards. Welcome, Doug. Thank you, and uh, good morning. And thank you so much for that wonderful music. I mean, you go from triumph to triumph. It's just quite remarkable to me. So uh, many of you will know that, that uh, well, I've never met a microphone I didn't like. And uh, the, the real challenge today for the people coordinating the service is getting a big enough hook to get me off this stage once I, once I get, get going. But I, I really, really uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to talk uh, about poverty, the guaranteed annual income, what it means to be Canadian, and what it means to be Unitarian Universalist. Because uh, again, we're, we're at a crossroads uh, uh, in our history, uh, both as uh, Canadians, but also as world citizens. And I have to say that I'm very, very gratified, especially in the United States now, uh, on the democratic side of the, uh, the national discussion about candidacy, is that a lot of Martin Luther King Jr.'s work around the guaranteed annual in income is coming uh, to the surface again. And, and many of you will, will know of Dr. Martin Luther King as being a, a great humanitarian. But also in the 60s, he was a champion of a different way of, of, of serving people in the United States and uh, through the guaranteed annual income. Now when I say I'm the expert, I'm an expert on the guaranteed annual income, I have to, I have to sort of issue you with, uh, sort of explain how that came about. It's simply because the other two people in Canada have died. And um, it's quite true. Every time the CBC, every time the CBC starts talking about things like welfare reform, the Canadian Council on Social Development, poverty, blah, blah, blah. They look to publish master's thesis. About, they look under guaranteed income, and my name pops up. Because I have a published thesis at UBC around the guaranteed income. is the only thing that was written in the last 50 years about, about uh, the guaranteed income, and my name pops up. So they get me on the radio, and I talk, you know, beak off uh, about, about poverty and so forth. And it's simply because everybody else has passed away. Um, but more and more, there is interest in, 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 what is, in what is going on. And I've written down a lot of what I wanted to say, because I didn't want to miss out anything. But before I begin, I would, I would like to, again, to just acknowledge the amazing people in this congregation, and Marion Goddard in, uh, in, in particular. In 1983, when we started the food bank, in 1983, we started the food bank with borrowed trucks, borrowed warehouse spaces, borrowed everything, because in our innocence and naivete, we thought that the food bank would be a very, very short-lived thing, that the, the provincial local and local governments would see 
that there was a real inequity uh, in, and, and that poverty was prevalent and that people had to w go to food banks in order to simply to survive. Marion Goddard from this church was one of the first people that came out and was one of our amazing volunteers who made the whole thing happen. And uh, Marion was just amazing, as were many, many other people in this congregation. So I'll begin with sort of my written comments, and I'll sort of meander around a bit uh, and talk a bit about my own experience and what I see happening in Canada these days. So Charles Dickens, who we Unitarians like to claim, famously said that the poor will always be with us. He was a product of Victorian times, and his quote seems to be said more in grief than anything else. I believe that the recent resurgence in national pride and discussion about what it means to be Canadian invites us not only to bring attention to Canada's shameful poverty rate, but to set out actions consistent with our Unitarian universal, Universalist principles. Many of you will know that, that, that uh, Canada has a very high poverty rate and that British Columbia has the highest poverty rate in Canada. But before continuing, I just want to uh, issue a caveat, and that is my exploration of the causes of poverty and the impact of poverty in Canada originally began, began as an academic analysis of the economic aspects of poverty. But as I became involved in community organizing work, it became personal. It became more than economic analysis. It became a series of human stories that in a modern society considered to be one of the best countries in the world, it became obvious to me that poverty was a deep hole of despair that was becoming increasingly difficult to climb out of. I want to acknowledge my privilege as an educated and employed male and as a member of the middle class. I have never been poor. Like many of us, I've had the luck to win the lottery. I've never been unemployed, divorced, or relocated against my better judgment. I've been able to make the most of the decisions that have affected my life in profound ways. Although my mother, who I always talk about my mom because she was one of the biggest inspirations to me. Um, my mom, who inspired me with her activism and who had been part of the Fabian Socialist Movement at University in England in the 1930s, to her dying day could never quite reconcile the fact that as a social worker engaged in community development, I was also paid a salary. As a Unitarian Universalist, it became clear to me that poverty is the underlying factor in most social problems. That is, the key determinants of poverty in Canada usually are related to divorce, being a female head of a family, chronic illness, and being First Nations, and now, of course, being employed in a minimum, minimum wage service occupation in Vancouver. As a beginning social worker in the front lines of child welfare and mental health, it soon became obvious that there were two parallel systems, one for the rich and one for the poor. I'm being very simplistic, right? One for the rich and one for the poor. Rich kids do not get removed from their families. And poverty was considered pathological. That is, poor people somehow deserved to be poor and deserved all of the bad things that happened to them. If you were poor, you were punished. The income assistance files, when I, when I started off as a social worker, the income assistance files in government offices used to clank because as a condition of receiving income assistance, applicants had to surrender the license plates of their cars. The fact of the matter was, and still is, that if you have the resources to take on the system, you are bound to come out of the experience much more intact than when you were at its mercy. At first, my interest in poverty was due to academic curiosity, but as I learned more, it became, if not quite an obsession, certainly a driving sense of outrage. In terms of my personal and professional background, in the early 70s, graduate work with poverty and the guaranteed annual income, uh, and at this point, I, I would really want to publicly acknowledge Lynn, my wife, who set aside her studies to type my papers. Lynn used to be able to type guaranteed annual income in her sleep. As an academic, I believe that all I needed to do was to determine the extent of poverty as it existed in all its forms. I believe that gathering data on the prevalence of poverty amongst the Canadian population would lead to certain conclusions for decision makers. 
and that we could simply manage the problem. In my innocence and optimism, I held firm to the principles of universality and the ability of social policies to affect change. I didn't clearly, at that point, I didn't clearly understand the depths of cynicism that governments could descend. At the time, in the early 70s, there was the negative income tax, demigrants, and guaranteed annual income experiments in Manitoba, New Jersey, and in Scandinavia. Canada still had the family allowance and the Canada Assistance Plan, both of which were forms of guaranteed annual income. My interest in that time was academic and naive. Surely, as Canadians, we could understand and address the consequences of poverty within a social policy and social justice framework. The early 1980s, in the Reagan and Mulroney years, put a stop to progressive work on implementing any form of guaranteed annual income, and in the interim, periodically, the idea reemerged in response to increasing levels of poverty in Canada. And I could always tell that because, of course, CBC would dredge up these names, phone me, and say, what do you think? There were never again any initiatives that attempted to address the causes of poverty. In typical Canadian fashion, committees were struck, papers were prepared, and never read. Most of the discussions just stalled at the definition of low-income cutoff, that is, the famous LECO, the low-income cutoff and rates of reflecting the realities of Canada's vast territory and diverse populations. And then, of course, there was the matter of Quebec. In fact, the impact of Reagan's notion of, of trickle-down economics with its tax breaks for the wealthy and the deregulation continues to this day. If you, if you follow politics on, 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 on the Internet and, and on Facebook like I do, you will often hear people harking back to the good old days of Reagan. You hear it all the time. So how did we in North America fall off the path of compassion to allow such an equality? How did we allow the gradual erosion of the middle class? How can we in British Columbia continue to live, in, live with poverty rates that are amongst the highest in Canada? How did other countries, most notably the Northern European and Scandinavian countries, become much more activist and progressive, protecting the rights of all citizens? I'm certainly not proposing that these countries are perfect but they seem to have the right ideas with respect to universal education, child care, and minimum levels of support for all of its citizens. It is no secret that the Scandinavian and Northern European countries regularly score the highest in measures of equality, education, and participation in society. When and why did we as Canadians lose compassion and understanding for our friends and neighbors who struggle to make ends meet and to survive in a culture that simply does not care. So let me take you back to the, the, the 60s and 70s to understand why the idea of universal income security is important. We, we, are, we, are, we tend to be in Canada an English culture, an English tradition. We have English common law. And there were many English traditions of guaranteed annual income. There were the Elizabethan poor laws. There were, okay, say this quickly, the Speenham land laws. Um, which came out of the 17 and 1800s, where farmers would form collectives to, uh, based on the size of their families and the number of children they had, to save money and to save uh, grain to feed their families at times when there were bad, bad weather and poor crops. Um, in 20th century Canada, we had a form of the guaranteed annual income in the form of the family allowance program, old age pension and guaranteed income supplements. Many of you will remember the mother's allowance that were universal payments to all families and children. Many of us remember Woodward's $1.49 day that were coordinated with the time that the mother's allowance checks were received. That's the time when families shopped for socks and underwear for their children. Everyone could do it because everyone received the same checks based on the number of the children in their family. At income tax time, all sources of income were factored and personal income taxes were reflected relative rates of income. But in the interim, mothers had a little bit of money every month to take care of their family's needs, and the local economy also benefited. Remember that $1.49 day jingle? In the spirit of equality, hope, inclusion, and human rights, we advocated for a national program that would integrate benefits programs like income assistance, disability allowances, 
and employment insurance under one universal payment to all Canadians based on various white papers and royal commissions. And, you know, we had an orange paper, we had a blue paper, we had a white paper, you know, we had a rainbow of papers that proclaimed the necessity of ensuring that all Canadians have the benefit of at least subsistence payments to ensure equal opportunity to participate in a civil society that valued and respected all of its citizens. So why did this idea never take off? To use bureaucraties, why didn't these ideas gain any traction with the decision makers? Was it the idea of deserving and undeserving poor? Was it greed? Was it the value of work through workfare? Was it the need to humiliate and shame the poor as bad citizens, not carrying their weight? Or simply, it wasn't important. In the early 80s, British Columbians were experiencing the lead up to Expo 86. It, which involved raising large areas of the downtown east side and dislocating people from, affordable, from their affordable, affordable housing. It was, you know, pretty bad housing, but it was theirs and it was in a community, and they had a community. Concurrently, income assistance rates had been reduced across the board and large mental health facilities closed with the idea that mentally ill people would be better served closer to home. We are still waiting. We had a classic bread and circuses response to economic downturn. Expo 86 was intended as a kind of trickle-down event. The idea being that rich offshore tourists would experience Expo, fall in love with the many investment opportunities in British Columbia, and return with huge sums of money to invest. The early 80s also saw the rise of food banks across North America. Cancellation of the Canada Assistance Plan replaced by periodic federal-provincial transfer payments, predatory trade practices directed at the poor. For example, uh, since the 1980s, we saw the phenomenal growth of Walmart. The erosion of the middle class, the savings and loans crisis in the United States, encouraging the poor to take on staggering debts in order to achieve the North American dream. We also began, come across, we also began to come across the idea of the working poor, that is, People whose incomes do not allow them to meet basic needs for subsistence. Our whole notion of poverty shifted to become not a condition merely defined by low income, but as a set of conditions that combine to obstruct people's expectations of participating fully in community life. In the United States, they experienced deregulation, and in Canada, a rapid erosion of universality. And many of you will know that universality, that is, wherever you are in Canada, you receive, you are able to receive the same level of, of supports, both education, health, and social. Um, that was completely eroded in the 80s, gone. Most pervasive is the idea that somehow universal assistance would result in loss of motivation to work, and that somehow people would take advantage and receive more than their share. It is interesting that most discussions about universal guaranteed income benefits usually stall with discussions about the most appropriate formula for the low income cutoff, or LECO. What did happen and continues to this day is that governments cynically include the value of donated goods in food bank bags and include that value in the calculation of the total value of income assistance. As recently as the last provincial budget, was that in February? January. February. The last provincial government, we, um, as, as recently as the last provincial budget, progressives looked to the government to establish a poverty reduction plan, which would combine income assistance rates, housing subsidies, re-employment initiatives, and increases to minimum wages and educational support. There was no mention of any plan, and income assistance was last adjusted nine years ago, despite inflation, a superheated real estate market, and widening disparity between the people that have money and people that don't. So where is the universal, Unitarian Universalist Association and the Canadian, universal, Canadian Uni Unitarian Council been in all of this? As recently as July 2015, the Unitarian Universalist Association, the UUA, Commission on Appraisal produced a report called A Preliminary Report on Class in the Unitarian Universalist Association. The report sets out the case for considering income disparity as a measure of class disparity and membership and asks, what is the vision for the future? Typically, the report does not include a call to action, but rather sets out questions for further discussions about social class. 
The UUA, together with other faith groups, has spoken out about fair wages, the income gap, and the loss of hope for many of its members. But most reports call for more study and dialogue. Similarly, the Canadian Unitarian Council, the CUC, has participated in the campaign for a poverty-free Ontario. But the CUC appears to have been constrained by the Harper government's war on nonprofits through its revocation of charitable status for groups engaging in political action. Many of those groups have been on the front lines working with people to develop local food initiatives, employment programs, and affordable housing initiatives. All of these activities have been acceptable to the government of the day up to the point when nonprofit groups extended their efforts to advocate on behalf of the groups they were, they were serving. The federal government of the day attempted to remove their ability to issue tax receipts for charitable donations, a death sentence for any nonprofit relying on public support for their cause. So what are we called upon to do as Unitarian Universalists, living our, our principles, especially recognition of the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, peace, liberty, and justice for all, and respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. When I was working in Russia doing uh, community development work after the, after the uh, Soviet Union broke apart, we were working in, in uh, Lit Lit Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and St. Petersburg, and we were developing literally block by block health services for local residents and we were forming societies and we got to the point where we had to kind of incorporate in, under the Russian model you sort of have to incorporate as sort of a non-profit business and I was really at a loss as to how to help in, how, to, how to define what we were doing and I had one of those UUA cards with the seven principles so I'd sit down with the Russian folks and I'd say okay do we recognize the inherent worth and dignity of every person yep absolutely okay we'll put that one in uh, do we believe in justice equity and compassion in human relations Absolutely, we put that one in. But when you got to the interdependent web of all existence, there is no Russian translation for that. <laughs> so in, in the Baltic area of Russia, there are all sorts of, of wonderful local, locally based health groups that are based on, on the six Unitarian principles. So how can we continue to live in communities where there are such wide gaps between those who do not have enough and those who have much more than they will ever need? The idea of the guaranteed annual income in any of its forms offers an efficient, effective, and most importantly, a compassionate approach to ensuring that people have what they need to participate in society. Recently, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s support for the guaranteed annual income has been discussed mostly from the perspective that he was a socialist. And that seems to have stalled the consideration of the guaranteed annual income as a solution to poverty in the United States, is that it is socialism. It seems to me right now uh, it seems to me that right now is a propitious time to acknowledge the extent of poverty in Canada and its effects. Lack of hope, despair, inability to participate fully in community life, fear, children not able to fully participate in school, despair that, that conditions will not change. We need to consider the range of actions that must be taken and effectively lobby the new federal government and yes, the provincial government to combine all federal and provincial entitlement programs into one universal guaranteed annual income free of stigma and public shaming. We can begin by supporting and expanding food security initiatives as a way of settling people down about the idea of reinstating income security initiatives in our country. Food seems to be a pretty, not a highly politically charged issue, and it seems food is the one thing that, that we've been able to, to, to use as a low-key, non-invasive way of getting people used to the idea of local initiatives in support of local folks. Um, this, this idea appears, the idea of, of reinstating income security seems to be le least stressful to citizens who are convinced that any improvement to Canada's social safety net will be open to all sorts of abuse. Um, there are many ways that, that, there are many ideas that can capture our imagination and hope. For example, local food production and food security initiatives. There's certainly enough food um, being produced in Canada. We just need to figure out how best to uh, get food to where it is most needed. I'm encouraged that recently the food security movement in British Columbia has been successful in convincing the provincial government to allow farmers to apply for income tax receipts for the, pro the value of the produce that they donate. This is a huge breakthrough. But I have to tell you, up until last month, 
there were many, many, many farmers and food producers around this province that freely donated excess production to local food groups. Not to food banks necessarily, but local, to local food groups. It's been absolutely remarkable how food producers have, have stepped up. And it gave us the, the very clear understanding that there is enough food being produced locally. It is low, uh, low carbon footprint. It's there. The only problem is, what do you do with excess produce that isn't being marketed through marketing boards or being sold? They had no way of connecting with local food movements. So by lots of lobbying and, and lots of just understanding around how we're able to do that, got the farmers on board. And I remember a number of years ago at the local food coalition, we, we, we connected with a, a potato farmer who said, you know, I've got fields full of potatoes that um, I'm, I'm going to be plowing under because I've re reached my, my limit with the uh, marketing board and I simply have no market for these potatoes. And we said, well, we'll show up with some trucks and some volunteers and we'll get the potatoes. They said, great. So he showed up at his farm and he had this great big machine and he almost fell off at laughing because we showed up with, with our Wellingtons, our shovels, a bunch of bags and some pickup trucks. This guy who also happens to be the brother of our lieutenant governor, uh, said, I, I think you have the wrong idea. He cranks up his machine. It not only takes the potatoes out of the ground, it sizes them, it washes them. And he said, do you want 10 pound or five pound bags? We said, we would like five, uh, bum, 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 five pound bags, all washed, beautiful. And we put them in the trucks and away we went. It was fantastic. And there we were, you know, these, you know, sincere and, and, you know, earnest volunteers with our shovels. We were going to dig potatoes, by God. Um, but it was that kind of thing. It was this, that kind of thing that they, they just, they just did. And in fact, we distribute, in, in, in Delta, we distributed more potatoes from, from local growers, more tomatoes from local greenhouses, and more, more uh, bread from local producers through the credit unions and the libraries. Well, look at it this way. Credit unions and libraries are places where people go for all sorts of things. And they said to us, why don't you just put a table? So we have a little table that says, this is a project of the Delta Food Coalition. Take what you need. What a concept. Take what you need. So people would get one onion, three potatoes, and a tomato. And away they'd go. Who cares whether they meet the, 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 kind of the, the classic definition of poverty or not? It doesn't matter. I was hauled before a group of local citizens at one point and to be asked just point blank whether I was a communist. And, and we would say, well, not really, but you know, who cares? Um, but it was that whole idea of, of the idea of that, that, that people may be taking more than their share or that it would go to the wrong people or people would resell their two potatoes, one tomato and a cucumber. Um, then we, then we um, we, we, we decided to have these local gardens. So we have what we call um, uh, uh, guerrilla gardens. We had guerrilla gardens everywhere, uh, done with the, f I'm, and I'm blowing their cover right now, but done with the full cooperation of the local municipal staff who would dump soil where we needed it. And we built these wonderful gardens. But then we had the dreaded Zucchini Thursday where all the people that grew zucchinis didn't know what to do with them. And so we had competitions for the best zucchini recipes. We, uh, we had, we had, uh, what we call pocket pocket markets where people could exchange you know zucchinis for other other produce and you always could tell the people that had the really good zucchini recipes because they would be do they would be doing amazing business but what happened was it became it became a big kind of community movement and people loved thumbing their noses at the powers that be and saying you know what we're going to take responsibility for feeding the people in our community and guess what happened the food bank shut down isn't that a good thing? So people weren't standing in line to get a bag of stale bread and craft dinner in a very public way. They were like everybody else were going to the credit union, the school, the libraries, the health units, wherever, Delta Assist, wherever they, they, they showed up, there was a table there that said, this is a project of Delta Food Coalition, take what you need. So there wasn't that stigma. And that's a very small, that's a very small example, but it's happening everywhere. Right across this country, it's happening. Thank God it's, and it's happening now, and it's happening despite government. Because up to now, they've put every barrier. Um, I now have a very lengthy criminal record. I, um, in fact, and how I know this is that when I went to get my, um, 
uh, renew my, my Lex the Nexus Pass, I had to be interviewed by Homeland Security because not only, not only did I have a record for being, you know, d d disturbing the peace and, you know, illegal, illegal growing of zucchinis. Um, it's true. It all shows up on your record. It's hilarious. I and mean, I got busted once for, we, we bought like 50,000 whistles and we got to every corner in, 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 in Vancouver and blew the whistle saying, wake up Canada, the poverty rate amongst children is not only decreasing, it's increasing. It's the Chrétien time when he had the Red Book where he said, you know, um, our, my, my, uh, my goal is by 19, uh, was it, 2000, year 2000, there will be re re eradicated poverty. Well, poverty in, in fact increased. So we bought all these whistles and people blew them and of course the police showed up and they said, who's, who's responsible? And they all pointed at me. I had gotten in the car. I got charged. I went to you know, jail or you know, just for a, a couple of hours. But it all shows up on, your, re on, your, um, on your, your record. So I'm really proud of that, actually. I have to say, I'm, I, 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 I'm kind of proud that that happened. But it's not much fun when you get stopped at the border. So food security is, is really the, the first one. And then um, the other, of course, is um, uh, housing, you know, uh, housing, and you know, how many, what, what, when Canadian, when, when Vancouverites get together, what do we talk about? We talk about the weather and we talk about the cost of housing. And the third thing we say in, in absolute grief and dismay is our children probably will not be able to live in the neighborhoods they grew up in. We all say that. We, we kind of come to accept it. That doesn't have to be the case. It simply does not. And we just need the political will to make that happen. And we, we're going back to what we used to call basic social work, you know, Maslow's theory, the hierarchy of needs, you know, adequate clothing, adequate shelter, adequate, adequate food, and hope. And no one can live their life without hope. People with whom we live in community, our friends, our neighbors, and our fellow citizens, deserve the simple human dignity to know that their circumstances do not define their worth and that they matter. As Unitarian Universalists, we are called upon to make it so. So I think we have, we have time for a little talk back, a little feedback. Talk. This is that, that, that remember, remember the, in the old days we would have these, these wonderful sermons, well, adequate sermons, and, and, <laughs> and in my case, adequate. Um, and then we'd have these talk back times where we'd say, you know, you haven't even talked about blah, blah, blah. Wow, I never even thought about that. But yes. Do we get, do we have, I don't know if we have a microphone or not, but is there anybody who would like to give some of their own insight, their own feedback? Michael. Michael, look at that. Michael, you'll need to come forward. Can you come? Oh, Michael, double. Just double. The city of Seattle, a few years ago, raised their minimum wage hugely. Mm -hmm. I think other cities in Oregon may be doing too. Yes. I just wonder if you can comment about the impact of that. Well, uh, you know, where, where the where the um, uh, the minimum wage uh, legislation has its, most of its impact is in the service industries and the, the restaurant mm -hmm. industries, and of course in, in Vancouver we have a very 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 active uh, restaurant and hotel association. And we also have a board of trade. You know, we we we, we were actually been retrogressive in British Columbia. We've had what, what's it called the um, the learning wage or the training wage. We've had the training wage, which is actually even lower than the minimum wage. And we've had that, and I think that goes what for three to six months. And then our our our, our um, substandard minimum wage cuts in. But of course, what they're saying, and of course, the big one, the biggest employer in North America is Walmart. And Walmart has a, a, a very strong, and I, again, I, I'm, I'm revealing my own personal political bias, but of course they've been, they, they're well known as union busters. They're well known as uh, organizations that um, uh, have predatory human resources practices. You probably saw the, uh, the piece that, they, that 60 Minutes did on there, what they call the dead peasant uh, insurance policies. In fact, they, they insure their employees, and when employees die, they get a, a huge payout. Often without without their 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 their, um, their employees' knowledge or consent. Um, in fact, um, it's it's been it's been the the, the 
um, the American, the, the, the um, parallel group to the Canadian Council on Social Development is actually named Walmart as the biggest receiver of corporate welfare in the United States. They receive all sorts of subsidies, they still pay minimum wage, and those are the groups, they have a very strong lobby, and they, I, Michael, I, I guess I'm, I'm rambling on, but there is a lot, in, in British Columbia, there is a lot of, of, of um, uh, resistance to, to going to, what's it, the $15 an hour, is that the, that's the, the, the minimum wage that, they're, that we're looking at, is subsistence, again, that, that meet, just meets the poverty line, the, the, subsistence, the low income cut off. And um, there is just a lot of organized um, uh, resistance to doing that. Um, and, but I think that there's a, lot, there's, there's a lot of groups that are still trying to work, working hard. And I think the, the city council in Vancouver is very amenable to, to moving up the, the, uh, the minimum wage just in Vancouver. But um, it requires, again, a, a, a real um, a, a mobilization of a, a number of different groups. I guess what I was getting at with the minimum wage is does it work? If you increase the minimum wage drastically, does that help? Yes. In fact, Seattle is doing uh, all sorts of um, uh, studies, they're online, that show that that money that those, those, those service workers are getting is in fact creating more wealth for the owners of the, of the restaurants and hotels and so forth. Yeah, it's, it's a, it, economically, and I'm not, uh, God knows I'm not an, econom an economist, um, but it, it just makes sense. much like guaranteeing an income. It puts money into the economy. Alice. Hi. Um, excellent talk, by the way. Um, two points. One is even though the minimum wage may go up to $15, the people on social assistance, guaranteed income supplement, uh, or persons with disability will not get an increase. Um, we, I don't know what the Wait, if you get, um, if you're on the federal government CPP or persons with disability with them, you get a 3% cost of living increase, then the, guarantee, uh, the um, normal social assistance rate takes it away. Yes. So, um, and if you have a rate, rate in, rent increase, you eventually. Um, There's a clawback. Yeah. yeah, and the second thing is, are you doing anything on the North Shore, and how can I help? <laughs> well, I will say, Alice, Alice and I are colleagues from many, many, many years ago, and certainly there are a number of initiatives, a number of food initiatives on the North Shore. Uh, there's a minimum wage initiative on the North Shore. I certainly can get people <laughs> Thank you. I would love to touch me. Sure, absolutely. City of North Vancouver has, has three or four exceptionally good social planners, I have to tell you. Yeah, they're just terrific. Doug, I want to toss in, in addition to uh, the minimum wage, there's a, there's a movement afoot uh, around the issue of a living wage. Mm -hmm. And yes. I think a living wage is an analysis that, yes. that is done to show what people need to make in order to deal with all of their uh, their needs. There was a report that was just issued last year, and help me on this one, folks. I read it, and it was that Vancouver has the, the widest gap between the cost of living and livable wage. Yes. Like, apparently it costs, let's say, that's for, for want of argument, $60,000 per year for a family for to, to subsist in Vancouver and the, the, the rate is 42. Yeah, well, it and would it's be. the biggest, yes. something like yeah. that. Yeah. My, other, my other comment I want to pass on to you, and as distressing as the issue around the disparity and the rising poverty rate in BC and in Canada, equally distressing, and the numbers are even worse than poverty, is the distribution of assets in the <coughs> economy. And the disparity between those that have enormous assets and those that have none is growing every month. I think the strategy for dealing with income disparity is different than the strategy for dealing with asset disparity. And I think it's the asset issue that is even more troubling in our economy. I think it's all part of the same issue. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's one of the equity, just equity. Actually, you know who you know has some really good cartoons about this is the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. If you really want to see some really good, I mean, I, I didn't realize how lefty their cartoons are. 
but uh, the, 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 the cartoons in there, and the, the one I saw the other day was about how the, um, this, this, one, this one boss, one, this one, one person was talking to another person, I just talked to our boss about a raise and he told me that, you know, that he works 378,000, no, 378,000 times more, harder than I do, and that's why he gets paid. But then, but does that have, it was like, he, he works 378,000 times harder than I do, therefore that's what he does. <laughs> Tim, hi Tim. Uh, Another colleague. Sir, uh, I've known uh, Doug Samoy for too long, as you want to <laughs> And uh, I love his modesty that he is the expert on poverty. Simply because everybody else died, and there's a message for you there. <laughs> I want to take you, Doug, this morning, right now, to fantasy number 17B. And fancy number 17B is you are running as the head of the poverty party in Canada. Mm -hmm. And you become prime minister. <laughs> and you have one plan, and that plan is poverty. <laughs> and you control the House of Commons, you control the budget, you control the bureaucracy. What will you do on April 1st next year? <laughs> Strike a royal commission. Because <laughs> that's what happens. That's what happens. Oh, and by the way, we have another cause. We have another cause for celebration today. I'm not deflecting your your question, Tim. We have another cause for celebration today. Today, as of last night, Canada accepted its 25th, 5,000th Syrian refugee, which is absolutely remarkable that they were able to, you have no idea how hard it is to mobilize that kind of effort overseas. So I think good on Canada. And you know what? That makes me so proud. And it also gives me hope, naively, that when I'm elected Prime Minister on the Poverty Party, according to Tim, I'm going to, I, the guaranteed annual income just makes so much, I would just roll in unemployment, guaranteed income supplement into the income tax system. I wouldn't have the social welfare and all those, those people I would just do through the income tax. I would just take the family allowance system, and we already have that in place. We have an income tax system that's already in place, because guess what? They find us. They know where we are because they want our income taxes. So that's already there. It's already there. All we would have to, I mean, I, I'm making it sound, oh, it would be really easy. It wouldn't be easy. It would be, it would be really, really hard. And part of the difficulty would be the entrenched bureaucrats federally the Indian Affairs folks, you know, the Native people themselves, they don't want change. They like the system the way it works right now, quite frankly. Anyway, I'm, I know, I know. Get the hook, get the hook. Thank you all very, very much. You've been very kind.